Hello, my name is Kate and I'm a science content developer here at the Royal Institution. Now, one of my favourite things about making videos for the RI is when you, our awesome audience, takes the time to respond and comment and come up with interesting questions. So I thought it would only be fair for me to look at those in more detail here in this series. It's always good to start a video off with a bang and there could hardly be an easier way of doing that than with this stuff. Back in August, Andy made a video about a contact explosive called nitrogen triiodide, which is really volatile. Now, as soon as all of you saw that, your top question was, how do you manage to make it without it exploding at the wrong time? It's actually really clever. What we do is we make it as a solution. That way, the water molecules stabilize the explosive molecules. Over time, that dries out and it becomes a powder, and that powder is extremely volatile and we can blow it up. EvilCow33 asked, could you set off the pile by just clapping your hands nearby? I love this idea, but sadly I think it would be really hard to do in practice. In my experience, when detonating one pile, which produces a sound much louder than, say, clapping your hands, nearby another pile, the second pile doesn't detonate unless they're very, very close together or, say, on a wobbly table. You'd need to produce a strong shock wave with the clapping to set off the pile. Look at that, right? And then, if you try and get it back out again, that's a lot more difficult. McCrackra was watching our 4D maths video with her second grade class and wanted to know how many dimensions are there in the universe? The first thing we need to think about is what do we mean by a dimension? Well, a dimension is just a way of saying where one thing is in relationship to another. So, for example, if I want to know where a dot is on a flat sheet, I need to know how far in the dot is from one side and how far in it is from the other. But imagine Superman was somehow flying over my flat sheet. I now have a third dimension. We need to know exactly how far in he is, how far across he is, and how far up he is. That's three-dimensional space. Because we're not flat objects, we exist in three-dimensional space, so we experience this. Now, not only do I need to know where I am, but also when I am. So some people do consider time to be the fourth dimension. Because most scientists work in space-time, they're the four dimensions that we speak of and which we experience. So those are the four dimensions that we can perceive. But there may be many more, many more that we can't fathom. So for example, string theory posits that there might be as many as 10 dimensions, which are all curled up and tangled inside each other in a way that we can't understand. M theory says there may be as many as 11 different dimensions. The gravitational field of Einstein is space-time. And it turns out to, that to explain phenomena such as the orbits, this geometry of space-time has to be curved. Kevin Gallagher asked, why do planets orbit rather than falling straight towards large objects? OK, there are two main forces that act on a planet to keep it in an orbit. The first is the planet's own velocity as it moves through space, and the second is the gravitational pull on the planet from the larger mass. Um, let's take, for example, the Earth and the Sun. So the Earth has its own velocity as it moves through space, but it's also being pulled by the Sun, which is much, much larger. The best way to understand this is if you think of a big rubber sheet. Because the Sun is so large, think of it like a ball sitting in the rubber sheet. It stretches space-time around it. As the Earth comes close enough to the Sun, it gets pulled into the dip that the Sun creates. And that's essentially why the Sun is attracting the Earth. So the question then becomes, why doesn't the Earth just crash straight into the Sun when it comes near this dip? Well, remember I said before that the Earth had its own velocity. Essentially, the Earth is travelling through space. As it comes near the Sun, it gets pulled in towards it, but it loops around it. Think of it a bit like spinning a marble in a funnel. If you push the marble into the funnel without any energy or velocity, it'll fall straight down the hole in the bottom. If you spin the marble inside the funnel, if it has enough energy, it'll stay up and go round and round and round. And essentially, this is what's happening. The velocity of the Earth perpendicular to the pull from the sun is enough so that the Earth doesn't just crash into the sun. It's effectively falling, but its velocity is keeping it from crashing straight into the sun. That's all we have time for today. Thank you once again for your excellent questions. Please do keep them coming, and we'll be back next month. <laughs>